Welcome to this edition of Theological Journals, 5.23 p.m., June, July 5, 2022. And we are now in Westminster Theological Journal and the evalu evaluation of methodological criteria for third article of theology, ecumenism. First, though I commend Habit's desire for doctrinal unity among the disparate Christian traditions, I'm skeptical of the ecumenical endeavors that seek or achieve unity by compromising core Christian convictions. For example, in seeking ecumenical unity between Eastern and Western traditions, Habit reconceives of the divine processions, such as the filioqua, becomes irrelevant and therefore unnecessary. However, different branches of Christianity exist precisely because Christians diverge on some certain fundamentals of the faith. Protestants and Roman Catholics and the nature of justification and sanctification Consequently, a robust theological method does not have to be ecumenical in order to be sound or charitable and enriching. Spirit Christology. Second, I take issue with Spirit Christology Criterion 7. I think there are better ways to make sense of intra-Trinitarian relations as well as the relation between the Incarnate Son and the Holy Spirit. Nevertheless, because spirit Christology is the single most important feature of third article theology, and as Cla Kyle Clouch says, is now, will remain a force to be reckoned with in the larger pneumatological and Christological context of Christian theology. I now engage with the subject at length First, I define spirit Christology, and I summarize habits, concessions, conception of its finality, then I dis discuss the problems with his method. Now, from Mid-American Theological Journal, Dr. Cornelius Vanema, on effectual calling and regeneration. discussing Trent and Westminster Confession. In the remaining articles of the fourth main point of doctrine, several further points are made regarding the work of the Spirit in actual calling and regeneration. First article two emphasizes the ineffability or unknowability of the Spirit's work in regeneration. How the Spirit grants life in regeneration is not so much known as it is experienced. Believers should be content to acknowledge that God's grace proceeded and moved them by an invincible working of the Holy Spirit to believe with the heart and love their Savior. Second. The Spirit's work of regeneration in the narrow sense involves more than an, that enables some to believe, though the choice to do so remains within their power. God grants more than the potential to believe. Faith is itself God's gift. Therefore, God grants both the will to believe and the belief itself. Third, the work of the Spirit in regeneration does not abolish the will and its properties or coerce a reluctant will by force, but spiritually revives, heals, and reforms in a manner at once pleasing and powerful and bends it back. The grace of regeneration does not act in people as if they were blocks and stones but instead renews human nature as it has been corrupted through sin. The spirit does not create a nature, but re renews the fallen nature of sinners to enable them to come to God in faith freely. And fourth, through the work of the spirit in regeneration, narrowly considered, is an act of the spirit 
God has appointed the word, the sacraments and discipline as the means whereby he is pleased to bestow his grace. Regeneration in the broader sense of effectual calling and conversion occurs through the gospel, which God has appointed as the seed of regeneration and food of the soul. 1.3 Effectual Calling and Regeneration in Francis Turretin's Institutes. A second illustration of the traditional reformed formulation of effectual calling and regeneration in the order of salvation is found in Francis Turretin's Institutes of Electric Theology. Turretin's treatment of effectual calling aims to capture the consensus of reformed thinking on the topic, distinguishing it that from Roman Catholicism, Lutheranism, and Arminianism. While Turretin presents the subject in a more scholastic form than the more counsel, pastoral counseling in the canons of Dort, he explicitly affirms what the canons teach in their fourth main point of doctrine. In keeping with the penchant for careful distinction and definition and distinction, Turretin offers a more sophisticated treatment of the distinction between and the interrelationship of effectual calling and regeneration. Therefore, Turretin's formulation of the order of salvation and its institutes provides a benchmark for subsequent engagement with the topic in Reformed theology to the present day. Turn now to Global Anglicanism with a new article by Rich Duncan John Owen and the dangers of Biblicism. So Sinianism will be examined under four headings, its methodology, theology proper, anthropology, and Christology. Under the first of these, the hermeneutical approach of the Sassinians will be contrasted with that of their Reformed Orthodox contemporaries in order to shine a light on the perennial pitfall of Biblicism. Footnote 5. As an example of the ongoing danger and subtlety of Biblicism, Timothy Keller recently suggested that the earth, that the English church circles in which he moves are too allergic to systematic theology. Then turning to Socinian doctrine, the remainder of the article will seek to demonstrate potentially catastrophic outworkings of the Biblicist model. The aim will be to present Socinian teaching as a system rather than a series of discrete flaws, showing how the integrated nature of theology resulted in a comprehensive deviation from orthodoxy that encompassed a dearly, deeply impoverished doctrine of God's warped doctrine of mankind and a woefully inadequate doctrine of Christ. In addition to John Owen, a certain prominence will be given to 2 John. While the pan-European phenomenon of Socinianism was by no means monolithic, its English incarnation provides a relatively representative sample with John Biddle as its leading exponent. Number one, methodology. So Sinianism very deliberately sought to position itself within the reform tradition. The aim in this section is to challenge that taxonomy by showing the modus operandi of the rep respective movements were far more distinct than is apparent at first glance. For the sake of comparison, we will characterize the Socinian method exemplified by Biddle as Biblicist rationalism, and that of the 20th, 17th century Reformed Orthodox, ex exemplified by Owen, Owen, of Biblical scholasticism. We'll turn that to that next. 
time as we turn to Dean Dyson Hag in the fundamentals dealing with the flatliners, the scholarship argument. Excuse me. The second question is also serious. Are we bound to receive these Germanic views when they are advanced not by rationalists, but by Christians and not by ordinary Christians? but by a man of superior and unchallengeable scholarship. There's a widespread idea among younger men that the so-called higher critics must be followed because their scholarship settles the question. This is a great mistake. No expert's scholarship can settle questions that require a humble heart, a believing mind, and a reverent spirit as well as a knowledge of Hebrew and philology. And no scholarship can be relied upon as expert, which is manifestly characterized by biased judgment, a curious lack of knowledge of human nature, and a still more curious deference to the views of men with a prejudice against the supernatural. No one can read such a suggestive and sometimes even inspiring reader as George Adam Smith without a feeling of sorrow that he has allowed his German bias of mind to lead him into such an assumption of infallibility in many of his positions and statements. It is the same with Driver, with a kind of sick volo, sick ubeo, airy ease, he introduces assertions and propositions that would really require chapter after chapter, if not even volume after volume, to substantiate. On page after page, his must be, and could not possibly be, and could certainly not extort from the average reader the natural explanation, but why? Why not? Wherefore? on what grounds the meter but of proofs and of reason there is not a trace the reader must be content with the writer's assertions it reminds one in fact of the we may well suppose and perhaps of the darwinian who offers this as the sole proof of the origination of different species his random supposition We'll pick that up again in our next round as we turn to Theologians You Should Know by Dr. Michael Deves. Yet a Christological understanding of the Old Testament were possible only with hindsight. Christianity could be neither authentic nor credible. In order, order to be able to face Judaism and Marcion alike, Bar Barnabas argued that a true understanding of Moses should lead forth to faith in Christ. Thus he writes, Abraham, who first instituted circumcision, looked forward in the spirit to Jesus who, when he was circumcised. Moses, both by stretching out his hands on the hill in Exodus 17, and by lifting up the serpent on the pole in Numbers 21, deliberately showed the people a symbol of Jesus. Again, what does Moses say to Jesus, the son of Nun, when he gave him this name, since he was a prophet for the sole purpose that all people might hear that the father was revel revealing everything about his son Jesus? Barnabas's intention is to demonstrate that Christ and the prophets were deliberate in prophesying Jesus' work. For this reason, he does not appeal to the New Testament to support his argument. In any case, he could not, given that the New Testament was not yet a fixed canon, but seeks instead to interpret the Old Testament on its own terms so that his reading can be seen to represent the inherent meaning 
of the Hebrew scriptures. After looking at aspects of the sacrificial system, the events of Exodus and so on, Barnabas comes to consider Solomon's temple and his treatment of it illustrates his entire approach. He argues that the temple in Jerusalem was an earthly copy that existed to proclaim a spiritual reality. The mistake of the Jews who set their hope on the building was to set their gaze on a copy when they had, should have learned about the spiritual reality from it. So it was with circumcision and the entire law. The Jewish mistake was to confuse, confuse the earthly signs with the spiritual realities that they represented. In looking only to the earthly, they found themselves enslaved to the ruler of this age and angels. And thus, by failing to be led by Christ to their own scriptures, Barnabas maintains that they had come to worship quite a different God. Barnabas's letter may not appear to cover material as urgently significant for the time as a, a theology of martyrdom. However, what he makes clear is that the battle for Christianity's survival in the hostile second century was as much anything else, the battle for ownership of the scriptures. Now turn to Princeton Theological Review for Shirley ba Sharon Baker's continuing redefinition of God's justice. The forgiveness of God reproduces perfectly, par perfectly the paradox of gift. God unconditionally gives up payment for our debt releases us from our debt and dismisses our debt. God, however, can and does give the perfect gift. Could a gift from God be anything else? Free from economic restraints and expectations of quid pro quo. Divine forgiveness, again, without atonement, without justice, is a perfect gift, a gift that mirrors mercy that triumphs over retribution and human notions of balanced books. D divine forgiveness is justice that triumphs in mercy. Only unconditional and, econo and economic forgiveness can be a true gift for God to require that we earn our forgiveness or that Jesus earns God's forgiveness for us through death or merit or satisfaction does not meet the standards for pure gift of forgiveness. If Jesus earns our forgiveness, then forgiveness is our due in return for Jesus' death on our behalf. In this case, by forgiving us, God gives us what Jesus earned for us. That which has been earned cannot be considered according to Aquinas' definition. Capito affir affirms this thesis in his own words. So if the other is to be forgiven only after measuring up to certain conditions, if the other must earn or deserve forgiveness, then to forgive him is to give him just what he earned, to give him just wages. But that would not be to be a free gift, but to give the other his due, to repay the labor of his repentance with the wages of forgiveness. It would not be a gift, but the economy of retributive justice. We'll pick that nonsense up again. As we turn to reform faith and practice discover, discussing liberalism, what has become come of it. The one difference Smith and Schnell find in the outlook of young adults and the ideological core of liberalism is that liberalism, being the product of modernism, was optimistic about the future, while today's young adults, being children of postmodernism, are quite dubious about the future of society, 
politics and the world beyond their individual lives. Nonetheless, Smith and Snell were struck by the similarities of religious outlook of 21st century young adults and the theology of liberalism that preceded them by a century, and which doubtless most of them have never read. The likes of Adolf von Harnack, Albrecht Ritchell, Wilhelm Hermann, and Henry Emerson Fosgett would be proud, they muse, adding, People, it is clear, need not study Protestant liberal theology to be well inducted into its worldview, since it has simply become part of the cultural air that many Christians now breathe. Tara Isabella Burton has recently distinguished between institutional religion and intuitional religion, finding in her research that America's religious nuns, those who claim no religious affiliation, are actually ensconced in religious commitments and practices, just not the kind connected with historic religious institutions. Borrowing her lexical distinction, we might say that while institutional liberalism is all but dead, intuitional liberalism is alive and well. More than that, that it is the default way of thinking about God, society, self, and the meaning of life in American culture today. Liberalism may be withering in its denominational form and passe as a school of theology, but it reigns triumphant in the far broader sphere of culture. This makes it simultaneously more potent and harder to spot, most especially within ourselves. A concluding unscientific postscript. If liberalism now supplies the atmospheric condition for our culture, what should the descendants of Machen do? The evangelical counter-strategy to liberalism thus far is focused on opposing its doctrinal tenets, its embrace of evolution, and its hollowed out doctrines of scripture, Christ, and salvation. While shoring up within our own churches and institutions, liberal proof confessions on these doctrines and adjacent issues, but we have not yet deprived liberalism of one of its most effective criticisms, namely that conservative Christianity tends to focus on personal salvation and doctrine of precision to the unnecessary exclusion of concern for the poor and problems of the world. Conservative theologians acknowledged this problem in the past, particularly Carl F. H. Henry, in the uneasy conscience of modern fundamentalism, and Francis e. Schaeffer, the church at the end of the 20th century. We'll pick that up as we continue now with Concordia Theological Seminary Journal, I'm sorry. Inadequate approaches to confessional subscription. The old bugaboo of Quatinus subscription. The argument between quia, because subscription, and Quatinus, insofar as subscription to the Lutheran confessions is old, but it must be mentioned because bad old ideas are hard to kill. Historically, even Zwinglians and enthusiasts were able to say that they would subscribe to the Lutheran confessions, provided they were permitted to interpret it according to the scriptures. Walther reports that John Calvin wrote in 1539, in truth, I do not repudiate the Augsburg Confession, which I have gladly and willingly subscribed for some time as the author himself interpreted it. Of course, Calvin was counting on a weak Melanchthonian interpretation of the Augsburg Confession, Article 10. This was not Quatennus subscription with scriptures, the standard but a Quatennus subscription with Melanchthon as the standard, 
this was a very low bar. We'll continue that as we turn to Journal of Theological Society on the renaming of Peter and his confession at Caesarea Philippi. But rightly or wrongly, primitive exegesis would not be content with the associations of the cognate word whose meaning is identical with that of the word actually employed. Pural is the reasoning may seem to modern ears, similarity of sounds of dissimilarity of sense, justifies the adducing of extraneous helps to interpretation. In this particular case, there is kalif to bend or to be bent, and it's pendant kapf, with which naturally present themselves and offer their services for elucidation of this mystery. Kephas, the rock, may chance become one of the kephophim that are bowed down, whom God raises up. Again, Kephas, the rock, may be delivered by bekephim into the hand of enemies. The actual word kephas is not kepha is not common in the oldest targum in the sense of rock. But the targum of Ankalos employs a very prominent and important passage as the equivalent of Selah or rock, from which Moses drew water for the children of Israel. It is in reference to this rock that St. Peter says they drank of the spiritual rock, following and the rock was Christ. Similarly, in the Jerusalem Targum of the Song of Moses, Selah, rock, whence God fed his people with honey, is Kepha, and Kepha stands for Selah in such passages as the rock. On the other hand, Kepha is used of the precious stone in the Targum of Proverbs. <clears throat> And this sense of stone may seem to predominate in Palestinian Arabic. We'll pick that up next time as we turn to Protestant Reformed Theological Journal in the discussion of the Holy Days. Ascension Day is one of the oldest festivals celebrated by the Christian Church. Origin was not yet familiar with it. In contrast, the 4th century Constitiones Apostolicae. Chrysostom and Augustine mention the Feast of Ascension as a long-standing feast. Socrates mentions that in 390 AD, the feast was celebrated by the people in a suburb of Constantinople, according to old custom. In general, the Ascension was celebrated in the early church in a wonderful manner especially in the Church of the Assumption in Jerusalem. In many places, a procession was held to depict the walk of Jesus with his disciples to the Mount of Olives. Later on this feast was also marred by all kinds of foolish and superstitious seditions by sins and excesses of all kinds. Vulgar representations were given in some churches, representing, among other things, Christ entering the gate of heaven and driving the devils into flight. Here and there, the dew peddling or dew striking was in vogue, a parody of the early morning walk of Jesus to the Mount of Olives, where sometimes crowds of people arose very early in the morning to sing and play outside in the fields or forests. After the Reformation, the situation remained essentially as it was. The Reformed were generally against the holidays, but had to accommodate the people according to the wishes of the government. After 1581, Ascension Day was counted among the Christian holidays. However, in the first few years after that, it was not yet observed everywhere as an ecclesiastical holiday. And where preaching was not faithfully maintained, Ascension Day was considered as a day off on which the people could go out, receive family visits. This is still the practice on Ascension Day. 
on one day in the middle of the week in early summer. It is so appealing to go out and hold meetings for missions or Christian associations. This is not necessarily due to an underestimation of the gospel of the ascension, but it may very easily be accompanied by a neglect of the purpose of the day. Therefore, it was necessary that the church could, should consecrate the tone of the day by preaching the glorious gospel of the resurrection of Jesus, who as mediator had ascended into heaven to guide, care for, and quicken his people with life and strength. We'll bring that to a close. We turn to Themelios. And this is a discussion of the reversal motif in 1 Samuel 2 and Esther. By highlighting a conflict between the son of Kish and an Agagite, the author of Esther makes the book of Samuel the backdrop of his narrative. In this way, the author signals his intention for readers to recognize the parallels that exist between the two narratives. Namely, the reversals embedded in the book of Samuel will be repeated in the book of Esther. Just as the poor rise and the arrogant fall in Samuel, so also the poor will be exalted and the arrogant will fall in Esther, thus revealing the Lord's all-encompassing sovereignty. The implication of this is that the Lord is not just sovereign in Israel and over Israel's kings, but also sovereign over Persia and the Persian Empire. Yahweh is not a God bound by geographic territory. Instead, the whole earth belongs to him. And it is his hand that brings down the princes and raises up the poor. Pick that up again as we turn to New Horizons, Foreign Missions in the Days of Our Youth, a story by Benjamin Hopp. Warwens was still in high school when he came to worship with us at the church in Port-au-Prince. He'd been a baptized member of the church since 2017 and completed his secondary education a couple of years ago. What does a young man do after high school if he has a mother and young sisters to support? How does a young Christian man think about providing for a future family in Haiti? For the war winds, that possibility came in the form of a veterinary technician program run by a missionary veterinarian in Haiti. The program involves a series of week-long sessions where students learn both in the classroom and in the field. They study care of local animals, cats, dogs, goats, pigs, and horses. The OPC Haiti Mission had encouraged another young man to do this program, but he quit after just two months because he thought he had found another better opportunity. How did Warwin's fare? We're grateful to report that he completed the program in 2021-22. The, unex the unpredictable security situation meant that travel to the program site in rural Haiti was at times very dangerous. But the Lord provided protection and Warwins will graduate in May 2022. I th how thankful we are for the opportunity this will give him to work and grow into a young man who can care for his family and give back to the church. Young people in a difficult situation why are young people like Warwin so important for the Haitian churches? Census data suggests that approximately 54% of, of the population is under age 24, put out by the UN Sustainable Development Solution Networks, ranks Haiti at 148, 156 countries. When you put these two data points together, it means there are a lot of unhappy people in this country. Is this 
any different in the church. I'm grateful to be able to report some stories of young people who are desiring to serve God and their church. These young people are finding their contentment in seeking the Lord and serving his people. As churches who support the work of the mission, you should be encouraged because they are living out of Ecclesiastes 12.1. Remember also your creator in the days of your youth before the evil days come and the years draw near of which you will say I have no pleasure in them. Being a young person in Haiti is difficult and discouraging, but the church has an important part to play in the spiritual and life development of our young people. Let me offer you a few of these stories which highlight both how the lives are difficult, how the church is helping them grow in grace. Estania, waiting on the Lord. One of the young women in the picture with Warwins is Estania. She's been a faithful member of Port-au-Prince congregation since coming to us in 2017. She has a beautiful voice with which she praises God in worship and at special celebrations. As she looked to the future, an opportunity came up for her to do a two-year hospitality program. She faithfully studied and completed the program, which included a lot of on-the-job training. She was due to enter the tourist industry in Haiti right at the time the gangs made a resurgence and the security situation in Haiti had deteriorated. What a discouragement for someone who had worked so hard and was trusting in the Lord. We turn now to the Journal of Biblical and Theological Studies with some comments from Eduardo Echeverria on Catholicity. In Casper's Catholic Ecclesiology, the inner unity of the one church is not only baptismal, as alluded to by Burkauer, but also Eucharistic. As there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of one bread. Says Casper, the inner unity has its foundation in one Holy Spirit, through one baptism and participation in the one Eucharistic bread. Paul can even say that we are one in Christ Jesus. In short, the church is one in Jesus Christ. And again, Paul calls for unity and unanimity in the church. He believes that there is one body, one spirit. Just as one hope is the goal of your calling by God. Furthermore, we need to make clear that pluriformity is not the same as ecclesiastical relativism or pluralism. As Casper explains, it would be an anachronism to read into the New Testament the situation of today, which history produced, of separated denominational churches existing side by side. In the eyes of Paul, such coexistence and pluralism of different denominal and national churches would be a totally unbearable idea. Denominationalism would affect Christ himself by leaving us with a divided Christ. But given that the church has one Lord, one mediator, and one Savior, we cannot replace the singular with the plural for the church. The reality of many separated churches would also leave us with a contradicting pluralism or confessional relativism. Footnote 30, Burkauer to Kirk, Peter Leithart's position on pursuing unity in a fragmented church agrees with Casper and Burkauer. The denominationalism is not what Jesus desires for his church. It does not fulfill his prayer of John 17. Denominationalism does not produce a church that is united as the Father, is united with the Son and the Son with the Father. The end of Protestantism, 2016. 
confessional relativism, meaning where thereby a pluriformity that tolerates contradictions such as that we can be indifferent to the claims that purport, purport to be equally valid. Says Casper rightly, sooner or later this causes new divisions and leads to indifference, rel different relativism in the question of truth. Rather, there exists a plurality of churches in the one and only church, which Casper calls a complementary communio unity, unity. We turn now to Reformed Presbyterian Journal, 1837. The prince who sends an army to quell an insurrection in some distant province of the empire does so for the maintenance of his authority. But had the rebellion not existed, no expedition would have been undertaken. The philanthropist who visits the abode of some sufferer to avoid afford relief is prompted by benevolence and compassion. Since, however, a reason is assigned for this in the following clause, it is better to understand this as the phrase of a sin offering. Since, however, reason is assigned for this, in the following clause, it is better to understand the phrase of a sin offering. Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, who through the eternal spirit offered himself all the sacrifices under the law typified him, who was sent to make an expiation for sin by the sacrifice of himself. In this clause, flesh is put for the human nature of the Lord Jesus Christ. Human nature had sinned, and in this sin required to be condemned. The whole man was corrupt, the understanding darkened, the will depraved, the affections alienated from holiness, and the members rendered servants of unrighteousness. Before any could be freed from condemnation for sin, it must be condemned in the nature chargeable with it. This condemnation is not simply God's disapprobation of sin. Though this was hereby manifested in a remarkable degree, a law maxism, a law maxim is, he that is condemned can neither accuse nor rule, before authority for such a one is null. Sin being condemned in the flesh of Christ, the sinner's substitute, its condemning power was thereby destroyed, its dominion broken its authority rendered void. The believer is freed from the law and from the death at which it deserved, though it still is found in his members and there carries on a perpetual war against the law of the spirit of life. It shall never triumph. It contends only as a disarmed foe. It is but the old man which, like the house of Saul, becomes weaker and weaker, while the principle against which it struggles increases in strength. Often, indeed, its power is exerted and often felt. All its accusations are without fail, avail, for it is no more than a condemned malefactor. The effect of this is that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. We turn to Southwest Theological Journal and the conclusion to this article on James for Second Peter and Jude. God's faithfulness to his promises. The theme of God's faithfulness to his promises in Second Peter 3 provides a fitting conclusion to this study of righteousness and the use of the Old Testament in James, first and second Peter and Jude. 
Peter reminds his readers that scoffers will come in the last days, Jude 17 and 18, mocking the Lord's promised return because of its supposed delay, claiming that all things will continue as they've continued since the creation. The scoffers, however, deliberately over, overlook the fact that everything happens by the power of God's word as evidenced in creation. Genesis 1 and 2, the flood, Genesis 6 to 9, which brought about judgment and destruction. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are destined for the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. 2 Peter 3, 7. Peter further reminds his readers not to overlook God's perspective on time. With the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like a day. Peter's advice on how one should think about time draws upon Psalm 90, verse 4. The Old Testament reflects upon creation in the light of God's eternality and human transience. Before the mountains were before born, before you gave birth to the earth and the world, from eternity to eternity you are God. You return mankind to the dust, say, return, descendants of Adam, Psalm 92 and 3. Paul attributes delay to God's mercy, 2 Peter 3, 9. Finally, since this present world will be dissolved, Peter exhorts his readers to a holy conduct and godliness in the light of the Isianic promise of a new heavens and new earth where righteousness dwells, Isaiah 65, 17, and 66, 22. In the meantime, believers must wait and make every effort to be found without spot or blemish in his sight. God's promise of a new home for righteousness stands in stark contrast to the vain promises of false believers who are slaves of corruption. As David comments, investing in this age is investing in something without a future. The future is the day of God and what stretches beyond that day. We'll turn to the use of the Old Testament in the book of Revelation in our next edition. As we turn to the Reformed Theological, Reformed Faith and Practice 2020, both books that merit rereading a long obedience in the same direction 40 years later. John Buther, Reform Seminary, Orlando. When the Presbyterian pastor and popular author Eugene Patterson passed away in 2018, he left a legacy of writings, most notably his five-volume series, Conversations on Spiritual Theology. The first of his nearly three dozen books was published 40 years ago, written in the midst of his 29-year pastorate in Maryland before his tenure on the faculty of Regent College in Vancouver. A long obedience in the same direction made a quiet entrance into print, and only after Peterson had been turned down by more than a dozen publishers. Critics did not recognize it as the classic that it would become. The literature search retrieved only two short reviews. In a brief notice in a Catholic journal, a review for religious, a Jesuit reviewer uh, noted that its presentation is enthusiastic. In the TSF Bulletin, a graduate student in theology lauded Peterson's drawing on the experience of a pilgrim in a way that pointed the reader Godward rather than back towards the author for his illustrations that come across freshly and vividly. Footnote. 
1, 2, and 3. Eugene Patterson, along obedience in the same direction as Peterson would later recount, the title proved hard to be a hard sell. The problem was not that it owed to a quote by Frederick Nietzsche, publisher stumbled over the word obedience. It was a dull word, dead in the water, and it didn't fit the ambiance of contemporary American religion. Pearson, Peterson feared that his parishioners had grown too comfortable with the world. Modern pilgrims had become tourists. His corrective was to turn an old dog-eared songbook in book five of the Psalter, the Song of Assets, Psalm 120 to 34. These psalms present 15 pictures of discipleship set in the context of pilgrimage that remind us of who we are and where we are going. In his own assessment of the book, Peterson described it as a manual for discipleship trying to counter the American lust for easy answers and quick solutions by submitting to these old prayers that were used on the road as pilgrims worked their way up through the hills to the great acts of worship in Jerusalem. We turn to the Princeton Theological Journal of 1837. right of the assembly to conduct missions. In our review of the general assembly, we stated on what we deemed adequate authority that the opponents of Dr. Phillips' report had taken the ground that the assembly had no right to organize a board of missions or to conduct missionary operations. We remarked that this was a new and alarming doctrine inconsistent with the previous opinion of the authors and adapted to shake the confidence of the churches in the conduct of our leading men and in the stability of our institutions. For these statements and remarks, the author deals with us with great severity, quote, can it be wondered at, he asks, that mutual confidence should cease when grave religious periodicals conducted under the sanction of men venerable for age and station are allowed thus to mistake and then hold up to ridicule and reproach the principles and re reasonings of the majority of their brethren. Page 97. Quote, we cannot divest ourselves of the unpleasant impression that their oft-repeated expressions of alarm may have published for the sake of producing alarm. Page 101. It is not so much for the sake of self-vindication as on account of the intrinsic importance of the subject in debate that we deem it necessary to prove the correctness of our previous statements and to show and to show that the ground was assumed that the assembly had no right to organize a bishop, a board of missions, or to conduct missionary operations. The questions before the assembly was somewhat complicated by the union of two distinct, though nearly related points. The first was whether the assembly had the right to form the contract which it entered into in reference to the Western Foreign Missionary Society. We have a footnote. The writer on page 85 says, the assembly was constrained by the urgency of the friends of the proposed board to appoint it subject to all the conditions and claims of that agreement or reject it altogether. The reader would infer from this that the objection was not to the proposed board, but merely to the conditions and claims contained in the agreement with the board, the Senate of Pittsburgh. Yet nothing is more notorious than that opposition was mainly against the organization of a new board. The second 
whether it had the right to organize a board of missions at all. These two points are so mixed up that it is not always easy to see which of the two the remarks of the several speakers were intended to bear. We shall present abundant evidence, however, that both were openly and boldly maintained. On the one hand, it was agreed that the compact was binding because it related to a matter within the competency of the assembly, and on the other, that it was unconstitutional. Firstly, because it involved an act of legislation binding future assemblies, and secondly, because the matter of the contract was not within the competency of the assembly. We will bring this addition to a close. The Lord be for us, who can be against us? Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Godspeed. This is the end of Theological Journals for the 5th of July, 2022. Godspeed.